Imagine suddenly catching wind of classified information that your enemy has successfully produced a super weapon that has the ability to travel underwater six times faster than its predecessors and deliver a nuclear warhead. That news is shocking enough to turn the entire navy on its head because no matter how many countermeasures are deployed, you're defenseless against your adversaries. Well folks, this isn't a movie plot, it's real life. There actually was such a weapon during the Cold War. And this is where the story of how supercavitation revolutionizing underwater warfare begins. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union relied heavily on its submarine fleet to counter America's elite navy. At the time, the US Navy was quite effective in helping to protect the shipment of reinforcements into Europe in the event of another global battle. They were also tasked with hunting down and sinking the Soviet Union ballistic missile submarines. The USSR was on its toes, so at first they focused on using sheer numbers of diesel electric submarines and eventually more advanced nuclear attack submarines to whittle down the odds against them. In the thick of battle, necessity birthed innovation. And innovation came in the form of the most advanced underwater weapon developed by the Soviet Union, the VA-111 Squall Supercavitating Torpedo. This highly classified superweapon was virtually unknown before the end of the Cold War and only became common knowledge in the mid-1990s. The Squall was powered by a rocket engine and was capable of reaching astonishing speeds of up to 200 knots an hour. But in a world where physics ensured most ships and underwater weapons topped out at 50 knots, the Squall was really the stuff of nightmares. How did Russian engineers accomplish such a revolutionary breakthrough in speed? What we are about to tell you will sound like ridiculous cartoon physics, something which couldn't possibly work, yet it does. Traditionally, torpedoes use propellers or pump jets for propulsion. Squall, on the other hand, uses a rocket engine. That alone is enough to make it blazingly fast, but traveling through water still induces major drag, especially at such high speeds. The only solution to this problem was to get the water out of the torpedo's path. But how exactly does one move water from the path of an object in the middle of an ocean? This is where the genius of the Russians became evident. Vaporize liquid water into a gas. The torpedo simply diverts hot rocket exhaust out of its nose which turns the water in front of it into steam. As the torpedo moves forward, it vaporizes the water in front of it, creating a thin gas bubble. By traveling through the gas, the torpedo encounters much less drag than it would in water, allowing it to move at speeds of up to 200 knots. Two decades and six prototypes later, their work was to see practical supercavitation realized and the emergence of a new weapon class capable of remarkable submerged speeds. The trick to maintaining supercavitation throughout the journey of the torpedo is making sure that it remains enclosed in the gas bubble. But as the saying goes, with great speed comes little or no maneuverability. Okay, no one says that, but, but hear us out. For the squall, this means that turning maneuvers were tricky as a change of heading would force a portion of the torpedo outside the bubble, causing sudden drag at 230 miles an hour. Early versions of VA-111 apparently had a very primitive guidance system, which meant that attacks would have been fairly straight torpedo runs. But this wasn't much of a downside for the Soviet Navy because the torpedo was armed with a nuclear warhead anyway, so it would still have destroyed its target. It is also possible that the Soviets believed that a torpedo's speed was more important than its maneuverability. So far, we've been able to establish that supercavitating torpedoes were originally designed in the 1960s to perform swift attacks against the NATO nuclear missile submarines, delivering a nuclear warhead at previously unheard of speeds. But like any other weapon of mass destruction, this blood-chilling monstrosity came with, well, some slight drawbacks. For one, the gas bubble and the rocket engine were very noisy. Any submarine that launches a supercavitating torpedo will instantly give away its approximate location on its enemy's radars. That having been said, such a fast-moving weapon could conceivably destroy the enemy before it has time to act on the information, as the enemy suddenly has both an enemy submarine and a 200-knot torpedo to deal with. A second drawback associated with supercavitating torpedoes is the inability to use advanced navigation systems. 
the gas bubble and rocket engine produce enough noise to deafen the torpedo's built-in active and passive sonar guidance systems. Early versions of the Squall were apparently unguided, trading guidance for speed. Although in recent times, torpedoes that adopt supercavitation technology use supercavitation to sprint to the target area and slow down to search for the target. This compromise method preserves the torpedo's amazing speed but makes guidance possible. Spanning 533 millimeters in diameter and carrying a 460 pound warhead with a maximum range of 7,500 yards, the VA-111 Squall set the bar for what advanced underwater warfare has become today. In 1978, the Squall entered service with the Soviet Navy and mass production began that same year. It is pretty hard to say no to a 200-knot torpedo, even in today's world. In fact, alongside electromagnetic railguns and directed energy weapons, supercavitating torpedoes repeatedly feature at the top of the wish list of must-have capabilities for any self-respecting futuristic navy, and it is easy to see why. The allure of sending a rocket-propelled superweapon that can deliver a nuclear warhead at speeds exceeding 200 knots to your enemy is pretty self-evident, unless, of course, you're the enemy in question. As naval competition heats up in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, we may see even more navies adopting supercavitating designs and adjusting their undersea battle plans accordingly. Undersea battles are about to get a whole lot louder and, unfortunately, deadlier. But now, that may be about to change with the news that Russian scientists are once again looking at supercavitation and Iran is apparently getting in on the act too. Attempts to recreate the supercav torpedoes or adopt supercavitation technology in existing vessels have proved futile over the years. The US has been working on such a weapon since 1997, apparently without any practical model to show for it. Indeed, the US Navy is currently in the process of upgrading the well-respected Mark 48 submarine torpedo for service into the foreseeable future. Then again, the Navy's requirements were far greater than Squall's capabilities, including turning, identifying, and honing in on targets. In 2004, German defense contractor DLBGT announced the Barracuda, a technology demonstrated torpedo meant to travel up to 194 knots. Barracuda was meant to be launched from submarines and surface vessels, and test models could travel straight and curved paths. However, the program apparently never translated into a marketable weapon. Again, in 2017, reports showed that Iranian forces test-fired a high-speed torpedo thought to be a reverse-engineered version of the original Soviet design. In the meantime, Russian submarines are the only subs in the world equipped with supercavitating torpedoes, modernized versions of Squall armed with a conventional warhead. In October 2016, reports began to appear alluding to a program aimed at developing a new weapon named Kishnik, or Raptor. So it seems that the 230 mile per hour supercavitating torpedo could be set for something of a revival. Russian industry also offers an export version, Squall E, for sales abroad. But what does this all mean for the future of underwater warfare? To be honest, we all have to wait to find 